Hey Liz, I'm well, how are you? Good, good, it's a pleasure to speak with you today. Likewise. Excellent, and I love this very, very nice blue background you have going. <laughs> Isn't it so blue? Yeah, it's the bluest. Um, yeah. And so to start off, I wanted to ask about what were kind of the origins of this for you? So I was looking back at my first notes when I wrote down this idea, they were back in 2015. Uh, I became a dad that same year. And I think becoming a dad probably uh, kind of forced me to take stock of my life. And, and um, I feel just incredibly grateful for so many things in my life. I've, I've found a partner that I love so much and we have our kids and I have two wonderful parents and I get to do work that's meaningful to me and I'm healthy and safe. And, you know, I, I have so much to be grateful for, but I'd also be lying if I told you I was just happy 100% of the time. I, I just don't know if that's human to to be that way or at least it's it's not for me and um and so you know i i wanted to tell a story about a guy that doing his best and and does have a lot to be grateful for and and he and he's happy sometimes but he'd be lying if he told you he was happy all the time and and he's he's trying to figure it out and uh that's that's mr corman you know not being happy can feel sad it can feel anxiety inducing it can also be funny if you have I don't know, a certain sense of humor, which I seem to have. So um, that's that's where the humor comes from. What about him being a teacher uh, unlocked the idea for you? I've always admired teachers a great, great deal. Uh, if I could wave a magic wand, I would live in a world where teachers are the ones, more than entertainers, where teachers are the ones that are getting celebrated and valorized and who are making lots of money and and where all of us are talking all the time about this amazing teacher or that amazing teacher. like. I think that would be a healthier world. And uh, I've had some incredible teachers in my life. I've always been drawn to that as a profession, something I, I would still hope that I get to do at some point in my life. And so I, I really wanted to, to play a teacher. That's fun. And you got to work with, uh, you got to work with kids, which is a new experience, I'm sure. Well, it's funny because, you know, when I, I, I'm playing a fifth grade teacher who has students who are 10 and 11, I was acting when I was 10 and 11. So I was, that was another reason why I was excited to play a teacher was I, I was really excited to work with young actors like that. I remember being a young actor like that. And uh, there's some really great performances from some young actors in, in Mr. Corman. Absolutely. I mean, I've seen the whole season, uh, which was a lot of fun. And- Oh, well, thanks I, for watching I, the whole thing. Of course. Um, and I'm, I'm very curious, uh, because very, there, you know, there's a very clear, you know, it was known before going, I knew before going in that production, uh, cha you know, shifted during, you know, a shutdown, but I wasn't expecting the story to change so much. And I'm curious what the original, what your original plan for for the for the show was before before the pandemic happened. Yeah, well, it's it's largely similar. It's so the first seven episodes of the show are the same that we wrote, um, and then the last three episodes are set during the pandemic and. There's only one whole new script that we wrote after the pandemic arrived, and that's episode eight, where you see the pandemic arrive. And then episode nine and 10 are, are substantially similar to what we had written. They're just now set during the pandemic, which kind of gives them an extra, I think, bit of intrigue. Um, but uh, yeah, so there, there was just one script that was actually mostly set at school that we just couldn't shoot because mm -hmm. we, couldn't shoot at the school anymore. Um, and so that one had to go, unfortunately. Uh, and it, we replaced it with what's now episode eight, which is, uh, yeah, now kind of like this work of historical fiction about this thing that we all just went through. I mean, that is like a, an eerie part of this whole experience, just knowing that, you know, the stuff that we've been making and watching for the last year is going to be this own, like, you know, real time document of what it's been like. It's funny, you know, I, I feel like for a lot of shows, you can ignore the pandemic and I totally get and respect that. Our show is sort of at its core, trying to feel real about real life in today's real world. It's, it's not so much a, a, like about escapism. And, and so it didn't feel right to just try to avoid or ignore the pandemic. And, um, you know, I think, Three episodes is good. Just just the last three episodes. I, I feel like that's probably enough for sure. Um, yeah, you, that's, you, that's enough. 
you have a really great collection of, of you know, guest stars uh, across the season. Uh, you know, were there were there people that you just knew automatically if I ever make something like this, I just want to have them involved? Or were there people you wrote stuff specifically for? Well, when I told my mom that Deborah Winger was going to play my mom, she was, I, I'm, I'm not exaggerating, she was moved. Because Deborah Winger is a, a meaningful artist, you know what I mean? Like, let's face it, the, the history of Hollywood's portrayal of female characters um, is, is not great. And, and Deborah Winger, decades ago, was, was already saying, I, I'm not going to be reduced to a plot device or you know, a pretty thing. I'm going to play a full human being and she does it so brilliantly. And I just think she's such a wonderful artist and I'm, I'm honored and delighted that she played my mom and Mr. Corman. No, she got, she, she, you know, you got, she was definitely like the face of the you know, documentary searching for Deborah Winger. Like, it's great to see her back on screen. <laughs> I'm not familiar with that documentary. I'll have to look for it. Yeah, it's, a, it's about ageism in Hollywood. Um, oh, wow. That's exactly yeah, what I was just talking uh, about. Jeez. I have to really, I have to watch this documentary. Yeah, it, it's pretty good. Um, you know, it, normally I would ask this question about like, you know, why did you direct certain episodes? But I'm, I, I want to get your answer on why you don't direct every episode of this season. Well, there was a wonderful director who directed a couple of the episodes. Um, like you said, I directed eight and she directed two. Um, Aurora Guerrero is her name. Um, so she directed the the second episode, which is, um, you know, this character suffers through a certain amount of anxiety. And um, I wanted someone else to be directing me for that. Um, when you're directing, you have to keep your eye on so many things. And I knew that for that episode, I wanted to be able to kind of lose myself and, and just go wholeheartedly into the emotions the character was feeling. And Aurora was such a wonderful guide and, um, and director uh, doing that. Um, and, uh, and yeah, she's just a wonderful collaborator in general. I, I know you have a long standing relationship with Ryan Johnson. Have you figured out a way to sneak into Knives Out 2 yet? <laughs> we'll see, I hope so. <laughs> Excellent, well, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, great talking to you. Thank you, Liz.